but I'm not the only one. There's a young lady over here that's a grandmother. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's see, three more in about 10, 12 years. <laughs> All righty, are we rolling? Because you look, because <laughs> you don't look like we are. All right, Luke uh, chapter uh, 24, and um, verse 18. We're also in your workbook. We're on page 19 at the bottom of the page, walking with the stranger. <clears throat> All right, I'm just going to read uh, verse 18 and 19 then. It's in your book there if you want to, or it's in the other book called the Bible. Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? And he, the he here is Jesus, and he said unto them, What things? And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty indeed in word before God and all the people. So, uh, again, <clears throat> the disciples are telling Jesus what's going on. They're telling him. And, and uh, they're, they're saying, what are you, a stranger? And you don't know what's going on in these days? And Jesus says to them, what things? <clears throat> I did a search once, and this was a personal search. I don't remember if I ever shared it with the body, either in church or, or in um, Bible school. But... <clears throat> did a search on the questions of Jesus, because if you think about it, you'll, you'll, you'll remember, or if you just read through looking for it, Jesus asks a lot of questions. In fact, God asks questions. <clears throat> um, that was one of the things that amazed me, because uh, uh, like in the book of Job, Job was all confused about things, and you know, and he's saying, well, God, what about this? And why this? And what about this? Which is common for us to, you know, what, why, how, whatever. And there's two chapters dedicated to God asking Job, where were you? What was, you know, this and that? And, <clears throat> and those questions. And the questions that God asks are very, very penetrating and powerful. So much, so I was so much affected by that that I asked the Lord, I asked the that if he would allow the Holy Spirit to give me questions to pose from time to time when I'm preaching and teaching that would impact the way that Jesus did. And, and uh, you know, if we were the Son of God and just died and rose again, and somebody asked us, you don't know what's going on? What would be our response? Of course I know what's going on. I'm the son of God. You don't know what's going on. Don't ask me what's going on. I know what's going on. You don't, right? Because we don't, I mean, and we're not even the son of God as in the sense of being Christ or anything. We don't like looking like we don't know something or looking like we're dumb or looking like we're not in the loop or something like that. <clears throat> and it bothers us. But you know, uh, apparently it didn't bother Jesus in the sense of it uh, bothering us because he went ahead and asked a question after they were explaining to him that you, you know, you're a stranger and don't seem to know what's going on here. <clears throat> Jesus said to him, what things? What things? Why did Jesus ask that? so that they would answer according to his thinking. His question would draw out, hopefully, but instead, what did they answer according to? They answered according to the circumstances of the day. Okay. Now, let me tell you something. Yeah, there are circumstances going on in your life and in my life and constantly. But folks, we already have eternal life. We're supposed to be living eternal life now. You know that? I mean, that's what salvation, we got, you know, a lot of people go, oh, well, I'll have eternal life when I die and live, you know. No, you got eternal life when you receive Christ because he is eternal life. What is eternal life? Life without beginning 
and without end. Not just life without end, life without beginning. Well, that's not us, and that's not an extension of us. That is the one who was without beginning and without end. <clears throat> so my point is this. <clears throat> There's circumstances going on, no question about it. There are hard things happening. Uh, you, could, you could say there were bad things happening to the movement of God. They, the movement of God, while under the leadership of Christ as the leader on the earth, had gone through major setbacks, false accusations, things that had brought Jesus to the cross to kill him, to get rid of him. But Jesus asked what things because he, he wants us to live above this earth. He wants us to live by eternal principle and not just be a pinball in the great pinball machine of life, bouncing around, hitting all the little things, and, ding -a -ding -a -ding -a, and randomly going wherever the angle that we hit something. We need Christ formed in us, in such a manner that whatever happens in this world, whatever happens, you know, people, there are people freaking out about the economy. Well, you know, did you know that there were Christians during the Great Depression of the 20s? Yeah, you know. And I, I'll just bet you anything, if they were really Jesus-loving, God-centered you know, Bible-believing, devil-stomping Christians that they were in tune with the Lord and the Lord still took care of them. Because if he didn't, that means God only works during times of prosperity. He's only effective during times of prosperity, which is absolutely ridiculous. <clears throat> the, Lord, the Lord takes care of his own, but folks... You have to have faith, not faith in the God who will do that for you. Faith in his heart. Faith in our Father. Faith in the, the, the groom. Faith in the, the guide and guardian called the Holy Spirit who will keep us and <clears throat> keep us moving in the right direction. So Jesus asked that question. Um, what things? And they said unto him concerning Jesus of Nazareth who was a prophet. Their focus is on not really the person, or can I say it like this, not really the essence of who he is, but what he does. What he does. You know, if they had have just come from a place where Jesus won the best prize for the building the best thing as the best carpenter in Nazareth, they would have said, oh, man, he's a great carpenter. He really does good carpentry work. And would never have seen the Son of God inside of him. They would have just seen what he did, whether it's carpentry or miracles or, you know, healings or whatever it is. They would have missed the essence, the being, and only saw the deeds of the man. And that's why they didn't, that, folks, that's exactly why they didn't recognize him right then and there. Because this was the risen Christ. This was no longer Jesus of Nazareth. Did you hear my word? This was the risen Son of God. And when I say that, I mean with a whole new body. That would be us. We were now his body, but we don't even recognize the one that we're one with. If, if you put yourself in these disciples' place, all we know is the Jesus that we were so familiar with is gone. And I, I, had, a, I had a circumstance in a time that came in my walk with the Lord where I ended up at the behest of the Lord leaving a certain ministry not because of the problems, but because the Lord moved me on, and what he moved me on to was new creation was formed after that. But for months after that, it was like 
the Holy Spirit quit talking to me. I would go to the Word and see nothing. I remember digging out my best notes of all my Christian walk from the time I got saved to that point and read them, and they seemed just foolish. I thought, this is the best I got. I don't even get anything out of this. I couldn't hear anything. I wasn't seeing anything. I went months without hearing from God and just thought, man, I have just, I guess I've just sinned so bad that God doesn't want to talk to me anymore. And if you say, well, what, did, what sin did you do? I'd go, well, I don't know. But, you, you know, I mean, we'll, we'll still conclude that because why else? I mean, you know, and why is he not moving in the old ways that he used to? <clears throat> it took me a while to realize he cut me off in the sense realm. He cut me off in the soul realm. And he said, you're either going to know me by spirit and oneness and relationship and know what is eternal or we're just, you're going to flounder and flop around like a fish thrown up on the deck, you know. <gasps> I need to have my soul fed. I need those things that I'm used to that I like that comfort me. And he's saying, no, no. And, and basically what he said to me was, what do you know? And at that moment, all I could say is, I know that I'm dead with you. I know that you raised me up in oneness with you, and now I'm alive in you. And I, I almost couldn't say anything else beyond that. That's all I know. Well, you don't seem dead. I mean, God's not talking to you and everything. I'm dead. I knew that. I, could, I couldn't prove it other than I knew deep within the depths of my soul that I had been crucified with Christ. And I knew that that same one, when he rose, brought me with him and made me one with him. And now I was part of his body, partakers of his divine nature. And that was like, almost like, you know, I got a new puppy. And when he grabs hold of something, he just holds on it. You know, and, and especially the more you pull, the more he goes, you know, if you let up a little bit, he goes, but if you pull harder, well, that was me. I was like this puppy that's just holding on to the Lord with all I got until God began to move in a whole different way and began to reveal things in a different way that didn't feed my soul. Does that sound terrible? Even the revelation of Christ can feed your soul? Does that sound, does that sound terrible? But it can because we go, oh. He spoke to me, you know, you know what I'm saying. We, we go through all that stuff, and we, we like it, and you can say we need it, but really we don't need it. I would say this. There is a time period we need it. There is a time period that we need it. But then he wants to wean us off of those things, and he wants to make us one, and he wants to form his life in us, and he wants us to be confident in the eternal so that anything can happen in the natural and we are not moved we are not moved okay i'm probably sitting here saying everything i should be reading and we'll never get through this book if i keep doing this so page 20 top of the page uh, this is amazing jesus is asking the disciples what things do you want to talk about what things is it that you want to explain to me? What is it concerning which you would like to open my eyes? And they think that he needs to know about what has happened to Jesus. And that's Jesus standing right there. Jesus is not caught up in the things that had come to pass in those days. He is more caught up in the things of the bosom of the Father. We are the ones who do not know what is happening. Isn't that funny? They're trying to explain to him what's happening, and we're the ones that really don't know what's happening. <clears throat> Jesus is no stranger to the truth of God, for he proceeded out from the heart of God. If anyone is intimately acquainted with the desires of the Father, it is Jesus Christ. I do not want to know doctrine alone. I do not want to know tradition. I do not want to know religious order. I want to know the eternal and everlasting Jesus as known by the Father. Why? Because there's a lot of religious people. There have been millions. There's millions on the planet. 
There will be millions after our generation is gone. The question is not how many people will know all the doctrines, not how many people will be, be religious or be involved. The question is how many of them will really truly know the Lord in such a manner. And, and let, me, let, let me just say this, because I don't even want to describe the manner other than to say people that came before Jesus at th this time, people like Daniel, thrown in the lion's den, uh, the three Hebrew children thrown in the fiery furnace. Moses tested in, in the wilderness for 40 years. Um, on and on and on. David, on and on and on and on and on. Folks, those people really, really knew the Lord. They didn't know a Bible handbook teaching of the Lord. The, every Christian knows that. They really knew the Lord, and that's why their name is eternal and still going on right now because of one thing. They knew the eternal God in a real way, and when it's all said and done, it's not going to be how much Bible stuff you've got. Not, not even, you know, you say, well, if that's the case, then I don't even need to come to Bible school. I quit. I'll just, I'll just sit at home in, a, in my room, or go to a monastery, you know. Well, if the Lord brought you here, that's all, that settles it. If the Lord brought you here, that settles it. Now the only part left is, will your heart follow his purpose in bringing you here? And that purpose is, yes. In, in the course of all this, I, in fact, I think uh, Kelly's teaching Bible doctrines right now, aren't you? So guess what? We do go over Bible doctrines. I've never sat in one of her classes, but I have a feeling that she lifts up Jesus more than she does the doctrine. Is that true? Because if it's not, we will deal with this. <clears throat> and and that's, that's the deal. That's the deal. We can still learn these doctrines. We can still learn the Bible in a better way. But let's learn the Lord. Let's truly learn the Lord. Uh, third paragraph down, <clears throat> concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet. The Jesus who was with them was a stranger, but the Jesus whom they knew was a prophet. And he was mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. All right. <clears throat> Which, and I realize it's the same Jesus, but it's not the same Jesus. He's no longer functioning as a prophet walking around, and he's no longer doing miracles. He's risen, and he's declaring peace has been made. The, the two have now become one. Amen? Which would you say is the most important? Jesus of Nazareth, this prophet who's mighty indeed. Well, isn't that the Jesus that we want? I got news for you. That Jesus left, and this Jesus that is standing there with them is a Jesus who is risen, who is saying, you are one with me now. You're not just, uh, you know the example, and you've heard me do it time and time again. Before, when Jesus walked the earth, we would say, touch me, Jesus, touch me, heal me, uh, comfort me, bless me, reach forth your hand, right, amen? And there's nothing wrong with that. But guess what? We should stop acting like we're the multitudes and he's passing through. We're now his hand. He's supposed to be touching people still, yeah, through us, his body. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. It's a whole different relationship. Not a different Jesus, but certainly a different relationship. Now we're not the ones being acted upon. And this was the failure of Israel. Did you know that? This was the failure of Israel. God said to Abraham, I will raise up a nation unto you, and I will bless you, and you and this nation, this seed, all of you will be a blessing. And he said, through you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Do you remember that? What, now, let's, let's translate that. What God is saying is, I will bless you, and you will be a channel of blessing to everyone else. Right? That's really what he's saying. But what did Israel do? What did Israel do? Israel shut it off, called the nations of the earth the heathen. There was another name they had for them. What is that name? Dogs. 
You are the heathen, you are the Gentiles, and you are unclean, and they formed themselves into a people who were the object of God's blessing instead of the channel of it. Okay? The church is in danger of doing the same thing. Where we go to church and we say, touch me, and Jesus is saying, look, you know, I want to touch through you. You're supposed to be my body. You're supposed to be one with me. The, the mind thinks and the hand reaches forth, but instead we're going, oh, here am I. You know, and it's like if he starts pouring the blessing out over there, you know, we run over there. And if it's happening in that church over there, we run over there. And we're, you know, and we're seeking something that finished at the death and resurrection. And we're missing, and that's why I said, that's why I made this statement. Which would you choose of the two the being the greatest Jesus? The one who's a prophet mighty in word and deed or this one who's just walking along silently sort of with them at this point? Nine out of ten Christians would choose the mighty in word and deed and yet that's not the one who's there, who's risen, who is trying to explain to them. But they don't see the stranger. They don't know the stranger. They, they're the ones who said, art thou but a stranger? They don't. He's a stranger. The resurrected Christ is a stranger to many Christians. The, the only need most people see for the resurrection was so that, you know, Jesus can be up and hopefully one day we'll go up. That's kind of the, the concept. Folks, he rose and we rose with him and are made to sit together in heavenly places. Most Christians are trying to get the victory and yet the victory came at the resurrection for us. Is that good news to anybody? It is to me too. <laughs> Hallelujah. As much as they loved that Jesus, talking about the prophet, there was one big problem. The Jesus that they knew, the prophet, was far, far away, at least in their minds. This is very significant. The Jesus that they did know did not happen to be around. But the Jesus that was with them, they knew nothing about. Were they disciples? Yes. Did they love God? Yes. Had they spent their life following him? Yes. Did they truly want to know him beyond the first phase? Yes. And we will see that they did truly want to know him, and that's why they ended up seeing him, the resurrected Christ, at the end of this journey. Because in truth, they did want to know Jesus beyond what they had experienced in the earth. And don't you? Does your heart cry out for that? Can the Holy Spirit deal with you right now? That's funny. That's the next <laughs> I must have known it's going to be getting you right now between the eyes, Patty. <laughs> as, I started, as I stated before, whatever we know of Jesus, we know nothing yet as we ought. That should not discourage us. That should affect us like it did Peter, who threw off his garment, jumped wholeheartedly into the water, and headed straight for Jesus. That garment is what keeps holding us back. Are you afraid of people seeing you as though you were naked? You will get to Jesus quicker without your religious garment and the undertow pulling you down. Throw off your old identity and put you on the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, bottom of page 20 is this uh, concept of where is Jesus alive? Now this, I think this little, it's just a small section, but I think it's so important. Because... Everybody believes Jesus is alive. Every Christian basically believes Jesus is alive. I don't know why you would believe in Jesus if you didn't believe he was alive. But the victory is not found in just believing he's alive somewhere. The victory I'm talking about. And, and these scriptures in Luke 24 prove what I'm saying. They, they prove the truth and I am just happen to be saying it. It's not my truth, and it's not proving the truth I'm saying. It is just happened to be, this is the way that it's, it's written and said. Are we having a problem back there? <laughs> okay, good. Uh, I mean, do I, I, I'm asking simply because if I need to quit so that you can reboot. Okay. 
The bad thing is I started this session by telling, explaining to everybody in future generations who it is that's running sound. So they're going to go. <laughs> oh, boy. Thy name shall ever live in infamy. <clears throat> All right, verse uh, 20, and 20 through 24. And how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he who should have redeemed Israel. And besides all this, besides all this, to, today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, who were early at the sepulcher. And when they found not his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. <gasps> Exciting! He's alive. We're hearing the message that he's alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the sepulcher and found even as the woman had said, but him they saw not. So there is this, there is a tinge of excitement that he's alive. But if you remember what we read prior to these scriptures, the main attitude was they were sad. It says that. They were discouraged and they were sad because this thing was not going the way that they had planned. Anybody ever had a problem with that in the Lord? You know, things that aren't really going the way that you really had planned. You know, the best way to get over that isn't to uh, just give up expectations. I mean, that would be great. If we just gave up our expectations, then we'd never have that problem. The best way is just to go with his plan. Then we'll, ne we'll go, oh, I'm with his plan. Hey, he took a right turn here or a left turn or went south. Hey, I'm with him. I'm not the head. I'm not the boss of him. I don't know everything. I don't know what's going on. I'm like these disciples. I think I know what's going on, and I'm explaining it to the only person who does know what's going on. <laughs> you know? I need to talk to you, Jesus. <laughs> I need you to get with the program here. And, it, and Jesus is saying, I need you to get with my program. That's, and you know what? I believe that is a need in the heart of the groom, that his bride be with him where he is. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. You know, so we go, yeah, he's going to prepare a place for me. Baby, I'm going to get me a big old mansion, man, big old double doors. I'm going to have me cathedral ceilings, and it's going to be nice. We didn't even hear what he said. I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be also. But we go, ah, yeah, yeah, we'll be with you. Sure, if that kind of attitude, we won't be with him at all. We'll be with, you know, heaven. You, anybody ever heard the, the phrase hog heaven? Well, they're in hog heaven. Well, that's what it would be if heaven was nothing more than satisfying every little thing we want. It'd be hog heaven. Or hog hell. However you want to, want to define that. <clears throat> All right, so let's read this paragraph. The disciples do have a message. Jesus is alive, and that's what they're explaining. It is a glorious message, but it's not doing them much good. I'm, I'm already jumping ahead of the words here. They are dull, fearful, sad, and void of hope. They have concerns about Christianity and the church, and yet if you were to ask any of the disciples whether they believed Jesus was alive, they would have responded confidently that they believed he was. Okay, before we read the next part, let me just ask you this. Is it possible to truly believe that Jesus is alive and yet be dull or fearful or down? It sure is. That's exactly right. It is possible. But let me ask you this. Could it be that we're believing he's alive somewhere and instead of believing where he should be alive at? Because Jesus being, you know, I remember when I was in Bible college and I remember thinking, uh, um, 
Actually, I remember that I went, uh, I was at a meeting and one of the, the, the preacher was up there preaching and he said, Jesus is alive! And everybody went, glory! And he said, he's, he's up there with the Father now! Yeah! He's, uh, there's no more pain! There's no more devil! Yeah! And, and I'm sitting there and I went, well, wait a minute. He's got it made, but what about me? There's a devil here. There's still pain here. I mean, what am I shouting about? He's, he's good, but I'm miserable. You know, I mean, I actually thought that. I, I thought, well, this, this, you know, this is, this is sort of a selfish deal that he's the one who rose, left us down here and said, good luck, <laughs> if that be the case. But you see, folks, that isn't the case. The case is that he is alive, not just at the right hand of the Father. He's alive in us, and that's supposed to be the victory and the means of victory, both. The victory is Christ in you. The means of victory is Christ in you producing certain things that would have normally ended in failure. All right, so... Uh, did I lose my place here? Okay, uh, they did not know where he was living... Just that he was alive. This is the middle of that paragraph. He did not appear to be moving among them, though actually he was. Perhaps he was moving in some other group of believers. And, and let me ask you this. Do you, can you believe that there are times that he's there with you and moving, but you just not aware of it? Just like these guys. He's there. He's alive. He's moving. He's active. We're the ones that are sort of dull, you know. Well, at least I bet he's moving well on somebody. Praise the Lord. You know. He's right here. <laughs> In fact, better than that, he's right here on the inside. He's right here. But we fall into these things because he's alive becomes a doctrine and not a living reality. Doctrine. Do you know doctrines? won't keep you, I'm going to say it like this, this isn't the best way to say it, but doctrines won't keep you pumped up. They will for a while. You can learn, you know what, you can learn all these doctrines of Christ in you and being in Christ and crucified with Christ, and for a while, they, because they're new and fresh, they'll keep you floating and happy and, whoo, and everything's cool. They will. Just the doctrinal truth will do stuff for you. But after a while, the Lord isn't happy with that. He wants it to be by life. J didn't Jesus say, I am come that they might have life? He didn't say, I have come that they might have their doctrinal ducks in order. <laughs> Do you believe that it's possible to be flowing with Jesus by life and actually mess up on a doctrine? And, and still be okay? <laughs> and I'd rather do it that way. You know, the elder son and the prodigal son, the elder son said, I never messed up. But he wasn't flowing with the father by life. He wasn't even in tune with what was in the father's heart. The prodigal son messed up big time. and ended up getting the fatted calf, the ring, the shoes, the robe. Why? Because he said, I'm coming home. I'm coming home. And the father treated him as if nothing had happened. All right. Um... May, speaking of Jesus here, maybe he had gone back to heaven and was busy interceding. At least he's alive. But if he's not alive in his church and in his body, then he is not alive anywhere. He is risen, and the resurrection body in which he arose is the church. All right. So what, is, what are we saying? <clears throat> Folks, the church, the body of Christ, the bride of Christ 
is the designated vehicle for the life of Christ in this earth. Did you? I mean, I don't even know if you got that and how powerful that is. You say, well, you know, no, the Baptist denomination, no. <laughs> the church, the body of Christ, the bride of Christ is the only, let me hear you say only, only vehicle of his life in this earth. We're the container. We're the vehicle. We're the means. Whereby, again, whereby, because we are his hands, we are his feet. And so, many people, you know, and I've, I've told this story before, but all throughout Latin America, you say, Quien vive? And everyone yells, Cristo, who lives? Jesus. And I don't care. It's, it almost doesn't matter what Latin American country you go to in the service. If you'd like to get a little excitement, say, Kim Bebe! And they will go, Cristo! Okay, well, good. He lives. Good, 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 good. Where? Then I say, Donde vive? And they go, uh, 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 You know, He's, you know, and, I, and then I, I teach them, hey, if you know where daddy lives, you need to know where he lives. ¿Quién vive? Cristo. ¿Dónde vive? In nosotros. In us. In us. That's where he lives. Don't get excited that he's just alive. Get excited that he's alive in the only vehicle that is designated by God to administer the life of Christ. <clears throat> All right, so the disciples did not understand this reality during, uh, during the, their talk with Jesus on the road, though they may have remembered some teachings of Jesus, such as, but he spoke of the temple of his body. They may have even recognized that we are the body of Christ, but is the issue that we recognize that we are the body of Christ or is the real issue that he is alive, not with us, not in the earth, but by virtue of his life within us? Many do not comprehend that the good news of the gospel is that Christ is our very life. Most simply agree that the information that he is alive somewhere has appeared and has appeared to many and they are content with that. He's alive. Some, that's, and that's basically what they said. He's alive. And some people have seen it. And we believe it. We bear witness. We bear witness. He's alive. Folks, the proof that he's alive is the fact that when you get in a bad situation and would have done one thing and something else comes out of you, instead of rebuking or instead of lashing back, you end up and literally take on that for others that would have... The, the very ones who would have blamed you and they were at fault, it would be natural to put it back on them, but instead you take that blame as if, you know, so that they don't have to bear it, so that it's Christ in you. And when that happens, you, you will say something like this, he's alive in me. That's him. That's not me. You ever heard Paul say, not me, not I, but Christ? That's not I, but Christ. See, that's not supposed to be a doctrine, nor is it supposed to be just a verse in Galatians. It's supposed to be when we get in those situations and we know, and I, folks, I, I know what I'm talking about because I had, I had one happen real recently with somebody that I haven't seen in years and somebody that had, you know, helped junk go forth on some levels and I just it's, I was just thinking you know boy if, the, if I get a chance and this is my mind I know Jesus is my life but I, I'm so prepared to do whatever you know to lay it out there or whatever and they walk in and boom the life of Christ comes up out of me 
the life of Jesus and starts ministering to them and dealing with their problem and helping them through their present crisis and whatever and never bringing up anything and never condemning. In fact, hoisting, as it were, them on my shoulder. And I'm, this is Christ, remember. I'm not talking about me, nor do I think anything of me. But I do think a lot of Christ. And to sit there and watch it, and when it's all over with, I went, <laughs> I mean, you just go, that was Jesus. <laughs> that was just flat out Jesus. It's the Lord. He lives in me. I'm happy about it. I'm really blessed that he can override even my little conniving mind. Anybody have a conniving mind? Yeah, you know, my little conniving man, yeah, I know what I'll say, I know, and then Jesus comes out and you go, you didn't even, I didn't even get one good, you know, yeah. I'm over there, my arm around blessing him, and, and here's what you do, and praying for him, and help, you know, and, and you just go, you know, there is no hope for me, there's no hope for me. I'm never going to win out. Jesus has already taken up too much territory. It's going to be Jesus. I might as well quit acting like in my mind, oh, yeah, I'm going <laughs> to, because it ain't going to happen. <clears throat> dream on, dreamer boy. <laughs> All right, so uh, the last paragraph uh, under that section, why do we even believe Jesus is alive? Because someone reputable told us he is? The means by which we should know he is alive ought to be by his life flowing inside of us. Jesus wants to reveal to every member of his body, in his body, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. There is no other life because the cross has removed every other life form so that when Christ was raised up, he filled us with that one life, the eternal life, that is himself. And there is this, um, <clears throat> there is this thing about Jesus being the way, the truth, and the life. He said that to us. He said, um, he said, I, I you know, I'm going to go to the Father, and da 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 da. And the disciple, one of the disciples, jumped on that, and they said, you know, oh man, that would be really cool. Show us the way to the Father. Just, just like us, this is, we hear something in a sermon and we say, oh Lord, show me that. The Lord is that. Amen. But, that, but see, we hadn't learned that lesson yet. So we go, oh, oh, that's really good. Oh, show me the way to that. Show me the truth of that. You know. And so Jesus stops him and he says, and that's where those words came from. Look, I am not, you, you know, he didn't say this. This is my, this is that. RT paraphrase. I am not going to show you the way to the Father. You're looking at the way. But you still think, now get this everyone, you still think that I came down here as your guide and teacher to, sh to teach you stuff like the way to the Father. But I didn't come down here as your guide and teacher to teach you stuff. I, came, I didn't come down here with the message of God. I am the message of God. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And there's a progression in that, isn't there? Way, truth, and life. We begin to get into this thing, and, and there is a recognition that there's this whole way of Christ and him crucified. It's, uh, I, I remember, see, I came out of working with Kenneth Copeland, and I remember hearing some teaching along this line a couple of times. But you see, before I heard that, I had heard teaching along the line of uh, healing, and I had heard teaching along the line of sanctification and I had so I thought that this reality of Christ and him crucified was just another teaching another part of you know it's just here we have the we have lessons on this and oh well here's a lesson on this I mean I really I really did I mean I, it's like you know well that's really good um, but then with time 
God began to show me this is the way. And, and, and uh, well, I'm, by saying it like that, I'm not saying that anything else is not true. I'm saying nothing else is the way but Christ. You see what I'm saying? Because he's the one who said, I am the way. You know? So let it be clear, New Creation Fellowship is not the way. Acts Bible School is not the way. Randy Nussbaum is not the way. Nor are we those who have a corner on the truth. Nor are we even special, except special ed. We are, we are not, uh, you know, we are not any of those things. We're just privileged to be able to get to know Jesus. And that's our true heart is we just love the Lord and we just want to know him. All right. But again, as we do, we begin to realize there's a whole way to this, and that way really is Christ, and he begins to form a way, like, the, like a way in the Red Sea. You know? And then with that, we begin to, truth begins to come, not just truths. Do you know there's a difference between truth and truths? Jesus said, I am the truth. It's not just a, you know, folks, there are a lot of, you know, let me give you an example. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Well, that's one of many truths. Right? Jesus said it. Give, and it shall be given unto you. That's one of many truths. But Jesus is the truth. And there are, you can, let me put it like this. The Pharisees did, you know, tried to keep all the truths and missed Jesus. The truth. Anybody get that? They, they were trying to fast, and they were trying to pray a certain amount of time, and they were trying to wear the right clothes, and they were trying to talk the right way and do all that. But when Jesus showed up, they were so involved, not in sin, but in truths, that they missed the truth. Is that possible? Yes. Well, I know it is because I had... I had done it in the past. And who knows to what degree I'm doing it now. You know, I, mean, I still need Jesus. But I, I had done it. And yet, I would never have known unless the Holy Spirit began to open my eyes to, to, to rent the veil and begin to show that Jesus is not just the one who came to give truth or truths. He is the truth. And then finally, the last part and the last phase is when all of this starts becoming just life in us. Isn't that a great thought, a great perspective that one day all that we have known of Jesus as the way, one day all that we have known of Jesus as the truth will be life in each and every one of us. That it will be the life of Christ. Not I, but Christ liveth in me. And it will be uh, as per what Jesus died to receive. People say, uh, you know, I want Jesus to get the reward of his suffering. Have you ever heard something similar to that? I want him to get the reward for his suffering. And, and uh, you know, we make that uh, winning souls or any number of things. Folks, the reward of his suffering is to get a bride that's one with him that's after his kind. The, the reward is to have a body that will let him express himself through and not try to express themselves as Christians. Christ will be the expression. That's his reward. That's what he wants. You, you say, well, where do you get that from? Well, let's just think about the last prayer that he prayed, John 17. Just look at it real close. I pray that everybody will be saved. No. I pray that the, the revival will just sweep. After my death, the revival will sweep around the world. No, he doesn't even mention any of the things that we mention. He says that we may be one. And he spends a whole chapter talking about it and praying for it and saying this is what's on my heart. This is my last big prayer before I die. 
You know, I mean, I've, folks, I've sat b beside the bed of many a person who was on their deathbed, and they knew it. And you would be surprised what they talk about. And many of them don't, don't talk about, well, you know, I was thinking about getting me a new.